All right. Well, welcome everyone. We're so delighted to have you join us today for our webinar. Um, I'm Dr. Leah Jeanette. I'm um, the director of our Master's in Bioethics and Medical Humanities program. And we're just excited to have you join us today. You get to hear from three of our current students who are in the Master's program, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, I have unique history with this program. So not only am I directing the Master's program and I'm involved in a lot of educational activities within the, within the department. I'm also an alum of the master's program. So I did this program, oh, the math, 15 years ago. Um, and so it's been really great to be able to see the growth of the program over the years and to hear um, from students specifically on what they like and want to see more of in the program and, and the growth over time. So um, I want to introduce our panelists um, just briefly um, and have them, you know, tell you their name and um, their undergrad kind of uh, background and where they're from. Um, and then we'll move more into the um, webinar itself. Um, Anushka, do you want to go first? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Anushka. I am a senior here at Case. So I'm actually in the combined bachelor's slash master's program here. So I've been in Cleveland for the past four years. I um, am completing my undergrad degree in biology on the pre-med track. And then I'm also simultaneously finishing my master's in bioethics. So um, I'll be graduating this May and I'm excited to graduate with both degrees at the same time. And I'm originally from California. So it's been I'm pretty far to come to college here. Thank you. Um, Gideon, would you like to go next? Sure, um, I'm Gideon. I'm also in the combined master's and bachelor's program uh, for biotics and medical humanities. Um, I did my undergrad in biology and psychology with a double major. Um, and I'm also from California, actually. Yeah, excited to be here. Thank you. And Emily? I am Emily Letting. I went to Washington and Lee University and I graduated in 2022. And I am from Little Rock, Arkansas. When I was an undergrad, I was a chemistry major, also pre-med, and I will be going to med school in August. Wonderful. We are so excited to have the three of you with us um, to talk about the program and CASE, Western Reserve, and, and all things related. Um, so just quickly, our agenda, um, we're going to just talk briefly about Case Western Reserve and the School of Medicine so you have a better idea of where our program and department are positioned at the university. I'm going to do a brief overview of the program so you have um, kind of um, a landing point um, in terms of things that we might reference as we discuss. Um, and then we're going to go into the student discussion. We're going to, we have some questions that we're going to ask um, our panelists and get to hear about their time so far in the program. Um, and I'm excited to kind of go through that with them. And then at the end, we'll do application process and deadlines, student assistantships and financial aid. And we'll leave time for uh, questions as well from those who are attending and some pre-submitted questions. So uh, if you do have questions during any time, feel free to submit through the Q&A feature here on Zoom. Um, we will save those to the end. Um, but you can, of course, submit um, before we get to the question and answer period at the end. So our Department of Bioethics is located in Case, West, Case Western Reserve University's School of Medicine. Um, we are one of, um, I would say, a medium-sized department um, in comparison to the other departments in the School of Medicine. But um, we are thriving um, because we have undergrad education, we have master's program, we have a PhD program. We have uh, postdoc fellows, and our faculty are doing all kinds of work, both in the education, service, and research space. Um, so the School of Medicine is ranked number one in the state of Ohio and 24th in the U.S., um, especially regarding medical education and research. Um, we are ranked very high on those things. Um, and then in terms of NIH funding, we're ranked very highly, um, na both nationally and internationally. And I like to highlight this because it it in terms of the research especially, it's not just work that's being done in our department, but it's a collaboration between our department and other schools, between our department and the um, area hospitals and um, healthcare institutions as well. And so there's a lot of partnership going on. 
And as you'll probably hear um, later on in the webinar, that is a lot of what goes on in bioethics and medical humanities. It's very interdisciplinary, it's very interprofessional. So there's a lot of collaboration across expertise and across fields and disciplines. Um, and so it leads to wonderful opportunities in research um, and the education space. So our master's program is currently in its 28th year. Um, most students complete the program full time, although some do it at the part time level over maybe a three year period. And then we do have additional students who are dual degrees with things like the medical school, the law school, uh, master's of public health, master's of social work, um, and master's in genetic counseling. Um, if you're interested in learning more about dual degrees, we can um, have a separate conversation and I can meet with you and talk all about the um, unique opportunities that those offer. Um, one of the things we're really proud of in terms of our master's program is the way our curriculum is set up. Being that it's 30 credits, it's easily done in a one-year academic timeline, 15 credits approximately each semester, and approximately half of those credits are electives, which means students can customize their focus within the program, and they can think about the electives that are going to help them along their career path, um, and that can include um, electives that are offered by our faculty, um, electives offered by our clinical assistant professors through the hospitals. Uh, we also have short-term study abroad courses. Um, and a big draw for our program is our clinical ethics rotations. And so students are spending upwards of 160 hours inside the teaching hospitals, seeing what ethics looks like in the hospital, at the bedside, with patients, with medical teams. And it's really a reflection of what you're learning in the classroom in an applied setting. Um, and so it's um, one of the highlights of our program. And then all students who are in the program have personalized advising. So you are able to speak with your advisor um, and you know, others, um, faculty as well, about what your goals are in the program. How do you have the curriculum meet those goals? Where can you go beyond this? Um, and today you'll hear from my panelists um, that a lot of them are pre-med, pre-health focused, but we have students who take other career paths as well, including pre-law, health policy, um, they go into uh, PhD programs um, along the humanities spectrum. And so there's a lot of directions. And so it's important for us that students have that personalized advising component to match what their interests are. So in terms of our uh, curriculum, we do have our traditional program, which by default, all of the students are in. Um, for those who are interested in specializing in a specific area, we have concentrations. Um, they focus on medicine, society, and culture, research ethics, and health policy. Um, these allow you, again, to customize that focus um, and really dive into an area that you are particularly interested in. Um, I would say our medicine, society, and culture leans more towards the medical humanities side. It is um, probably the most, um, most students are in that concentration. Um, but every year we have a number of students that do research ethics and our newest one, health policy as well. Um, all students, uh, as you can see on this slide, take the blue courses, so foundations in bioethics one and two, uh, clinical rotations at least one semester, and the bioethics capstone paper, which this, you'll hear today from the students they're working on currently. Um, and everything else then fits into the elective slots, and it gives you a lot of opportunity for that flexibility. So enough hearing from me. Uh, <laughs> I want to um, turn this over to our students. Um, but I guess the first question for us to really think about and to talk about is why did you choose this program? I think, you know, for a lot of folks, it's, is this the right fit for me? Is this going to accomplish my goals? How are you thinking about, you know, why choosing this program when you were doing the application process and making the decision to enroll? Anyone can start. <laughs> Um, I can answer this question first, but um, as I kind of like mentioned earlier, I um, am did my undergrad here at Case 2. I'm still in like my fourth year here, and I am a biology major and on the pre-med track as well. And I feel like I saw how, I guess I just noticed how like science heavy like my classes were, um, which is like normal for like being pre-med and kind of taking those like prerequisites to apply to medical school. But I wanted to kind of get more exposure to, I guess, the humanistic side of medicine and kind of like to learn like other 
qualities that um, being a physician or pretty much anyone in the healthcare field would need. Um, I took some bioethics classes during my undergrad years um, and I loved them and I wanted to kind of like immerse myself in it more, get involved in those clinical rotations, see how bioethics um, plays out within a hospital setting as well. And so I realized that I was finishing up my biology degree pretty fast and I decided to spend my uh, my fourth year at Case pursuing a master's in bioethics and just kind of completely be immersed in this field and learn the skills that I believe are like extremely fundamental in going into medical school later on. I can go next. Um, I'm also pre-med, so Anushka touched on like pretty much everything I would have said anyways. But one thing that I would like to to highlight, especially like Dr. Jeanette mentioned, was the uh, 160 hours of clinical ethics uh, rotations. And that for me was one of the biggest uh, draws for this program. And like just this morning, I, I had three hours of the clinical ethics rotations at UH. Um, and they're great. Like you get to learn a lot and you kind of see a different side of medicine than you would otherwise if you did just went to like shadow a doctor or something like that. So it's a bit more unique in that aspect and that drew me towards it. I did research in ethics in undergrad with a ethicist from the University of Arkansas for medical sciences. Uh, that's where I'm from. So um, I got plugged in with him and I was deciding what to do. I knew I wanted to take a few gap years before medical school. And in conversation with him, he told me that I should apply to Case Western because it would be the best bioethics program in the entire nation. And so that's how I landed exactly on Case Western. And I was really compelled to do ethics in general because I think it's a good supplement heading into the medical field. Um, I don't know how much experience any of y'all have with shadowing, but heading into the medical field, you know that there's going to be many experiences and moments where doctors are sometimes less than perfect, unfortunately. That's the nature of the game. And so I'm trying to make myself a more well-rounded person and be the best doctor that I possibly can be. That's that's awesome that similar mindsets, but also um, different um, focuses within your, your reasoning. Um, so to move on to our second question, you know, and sometimes it's hard to quantify best, you know, but um, if you if you can try, what would you describe as kind of your best opportunities within this program thus far? Um, kind of, again, kind of like um, going off what Gideon and Emily had said before, um, I do think like the um, being involved in those like clinical ethics rotations have been um, the best opportunity that I've had being part of this program, just because I feel like for any of you uh, on this uh, webinar that are pre-med, pre-health, any, anything, anywhere interested in the healthcare field and have shadowed like a physician or a physician assistant or a nurse or um, anyone in that field before, I feel like it's very easy to get caught in like the again kind of like that scientific aspect of it and like learning about um how they got to where they were but i think these rotations really allow you to see the collaborate the collaboration that goes into being part of a healthcare team and you you had get the chance to shadow social workers and people in like palliative care um you get to see how ethics consults actually happen um and when and what kind of like difficult cases um, would need an ethics consult could try to figure out um, the best solution or how to move forward um, maybe when like a family of a patient and the care team may not agree with um, the best healthcare decision and you'll kind of learn how to navigate the situations as they come along so I feel like this program really does a great job of showing you that there is a lot more than just um, a physician kind of like at the head of um, my care team, but just really shows how all these different um, people come together to really provide patients with like this holistic um, care overall. Um, I, I know like that's something that Emily Gideon also mentioned, but I think another really, really um, cool part about this program is just the fact that the faculty here are honestly amazing. My advisor is um, Dr. Anderson, and she has been amazing with helping me figure out like what classes I want to take each semester. Um, and I also am actually doing research with her as well outside of class. So um, I've been involved in her research as well. And it's been really, really cool to be able to 
um, work on this like paper with her and learn how to use these like ethical viewpoints that I've learned throughout my classes here. And I'm actually doing my capstone on a, I guess, subsection of the research that I'm doing with her as well. So I feel like it's very, very exciting to, again, kind of just like learn how to do more like qualitative research rather than the, I guess, quantitative wet lab based heavy research that I've been doing as a biology major um, during undergrad. I can go next. Um, I'll, I'll, I mean, I would say the real rotations again, but of course we've already talked about that. So I'd say the classes themselves are a lot more interesting than I expected them to be because like coming from a STEM background, I was like, oh, it's just gonna be a big lecture class. I can like have pay attention to, to the to the actual speaker. I'll just look at the lecture notes or something. But these classes are a lot more discussion-based. Um, and I'm also a psychology major in undergrad. So I've had discussion-based classes before, but they're not to this level, I guess. Like everyone's so engaged and involved because everyone like really wants to be there and wants to and is passionate about what they're doing so i feel like just being that kind of environment is a great opportunity my i've had two outstanding opportunities that come to mind and one of them was through clinical rotations there's this lovely retired physician at metro health which is where i'm at right now named dr fratt and he is like the most inspiring physician I've ever met. He's 92. He volunteers his time to come speak to students and really encourage them to pursue whatever they like. And he, I've never had such a nice hype man to, you know, keep going in the path and keep doing the things that I'm doing. And so he's been my favorite experience at Metro. And then in my classes, I've really enjoyed a lot of the guest speakers that have come in. And in particular, there was one who spoke to me about, um, in my environmental ethics class, about neonatology and the environmental impacts in neonatology, which just got me to think outside the box. And I am interested in neonatology, so that was really important for me. And a lot of these guest speakers help you to like think outside the box and think of things that happen in medicine that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise thought about. That's, I love, you know, hearing all these different um, opportunities and what you like most about the program. Um, it's, it's funny because I, I, I hear this from you, from students and stuff, but it's always nice and refreshing to, um, to hear more specifics um, around that. Um, so to our next question, what's the thing that you've learned, like either about the program or while you've been here, um, you know, in this program, um, so far um, that you think maybe a prospective applicant would would find um, important to know, or maybe even something you wish you would have known um, during the application process. Cleveland is cold, so get a winter jacket. Um, I'm from the South and it's been hard, but I have really enjoyed and learn and have kind of like learned more about I don't know if it's necessarily about the program but about myself and my interests a lot I came in like I said I have this huge passion for neonatology and I think that this program has helped me like decipher maybe different areas where ethics is more prominent than others and I think that that'll help me decide which career I might ultimately choose. So kind of like matching up what we're learning in class in like an actual clinical setting has been something that I've learned. That's great. Uh, something I've learned about the class timings, at least, is that uh, because it's a master's program and they allow part time. So and a lot of the students are like, adults who have like other things to do you know um they're not like full-time students um a lot of the classes are in the evening so you have to plan your day around that and it gets a little bit weird because you, you don't you're not used to it as an undergrad um so that was just it kind of blindsided me a little bit but now i'm used to it so just a little heads up i think that's a, a fair thing to kind of reflect on yeah the the adjustment of how classes work in a grad level are, are definitely different than undergrad yeah, and one quick thing that I just wanted to add was that, again, because this is a graduate program, there are people coming in from like all different parts of the world, um, people who like um, could be younger than you or older than you. 
and many of the classes that you'll be taking within um, the bioethics master's program is they're very very small classes and it's just a really great environment to really learn more about the people around you but also just like see how others think about these like bioethics like these concepts that we learn in class and really get to like learn about their perspective and see how much like these perspectives can change whether it's in a classroom or in a, a hospital setting in a clinical setting and yeah kind of like what Emily said it really just like teaches you a lot about yourself as well and kind of like makes you reflect on I guess the kind of ethical person I guess you want to be um, in the future and how honestly just how um, useful this program will be in whatever field you end up pursuing in the future whether it's something whether it's continuing bioethics going to the medical field or going to law school or pretty much anything else I feel like ethics is a very very um, it's a field that is present in everything and anything that you will study later on so so thinking more about like the program outcomes like right when you choose to come to a program like this people have goals and career aspirations in mind and we've this has been touched on a little bit so far but and these these two questions kind of go together but how has this program helped your career goals and and or has it changed or adjusted your career goals in any way um, we've touched on this a little bit but i'd like to hear more specifically about this I can, I can go. Um, I haven't really adjusted or changed my career goals. I came in going, knowing, knowing I was going to apply to medical school and I'm leaving, going to medical school. Um, I think that it's really helped me in terms of like kind of picking out, like I said in the last slide, picking out different fields that I'd be more interested in. And so one thing that I had already marked off my list coming in based on my shadowing experiences was emergency medicine, but seeing how kind of some of these issues that we talk about in class really line up with emergency medicine, going back again, it was really helpful and impactful and I could see myself doing that. So it's kind of allowed me to think a little bit differently um, heading into med school. And I also think it'll be advantageous going in because I, I think I'll be able to see, everybody talks about narrative medicine and everybody talks about valuing the person, uh, not the disease. And, you know, talk's a big game, but I don't think that they have the tools to back up their talk. And I think that this program is giving me the tools to be able to back that up going in and be a compassionate provider instead of just, you know, giving some medicine and moving on with my life, so. I fully agree with what Emily said. Um, but I also would like to add that me personally, um, I kind of like, I don't know, like I, I always consider like doctor as like the big goal, you know, but I feel like even if that doesn't work out, I have a background in bioethics. I could also just like go back to school later if I don't feel like medicine isn't the thing for me anymore. And then I could become a clinical bioethicist or I could do something else, but having another degree is always useful. So I'll say that. Yeah, I think similar to what Emily said, like I had always planned um, on applying to medical school and I still am. I'm going to be applying um, this summer to medical school, but I think this program has just really um, taught me the kind of like position I want to be in the future. And like I've taken classes related to mental health ethics and now to communicate with individuals who might have um, a mental health condition. I've taken classes related to how to handle the ethics of pain management and how to make sure you are valuing a patient's pain and um, treating them accordingly. So I feel like it's just taught me a lot about what it means to kind of just like do more than just um, provide like medications to a patient or um, treat their disease, but also to, to just like value like who they are as a person, like value their story and see how their entire like background um, affects their like healthcare decisions and just like respect um, why those decisions may be because of um, being in this program and learning about these um, ethical views. Great. So kind of beyond the classroom, right? So we've talked a lot about um, the program opportunities, but 
what what should applicants know, I guess, um, about like final thought of like, what should they know about the program? Like if you have something you haven't mentioned um, and then also, is there something like about the campus or Cleveland that you've really enjoyed so far? Um, I know for Anushka and Gideon, you guys have been here this is your fourth year. So you really have a lay of the land. But um, Emily, as someone who's mentioned that it's cold here, <laughs> it's different than what you were used to. So I'd love to hear, you know, what should applicants know? And, you know, is there something special about the campus or Cleveland that you really enjoyed? I definitely say that since I'm just here for one year, it, I kind of came in with the mindset of like, I can be as involved as I want to be, or I can be uninvolved in kind of extracurricular activities. And I wanted slightly more flexibility. So like, I, I'm somebody who like maybe wouldn't be super interested in being plugged in with research, although it's offered to every student and a lot of professors, you know, give opportunities out to students for that. Um, I would be somebody who'd be more in, more in tune with like looking into volunteer opportunities in and around the campus. And so for the first semester, I did not do that because I felt like I just wanted to get my ground, lay the land, my uh, feet under me, and then I could look into some things this semester. And last night in class, we actually had a talk about homelessness in Cleveland. And I thought that was like a really cool thing to do. And so moving forward, I think I might try to get plugged in with that for volunteering because I felt it to like kind of touch on things that I'm interested in and that I'm passionate about. And so I just have heard like a lot of opportunities of things, um, if that's something you're interested in. And I have not explored like I should, um, <laughs> but I want to really, stay where it's warm. It's OK. <laughs> I like the Tremont area. I just actually went there today for lunch and coffee. And it's really cute, in my opinion, kind of gives yeah. me like artsy vibes. So cool. Um, I think I can. Well, I know Well, me and Gideon. Um, we have been here for the past four years, so I think, um, I guess we've had a lot more time to explore it um, than Emily probably has, but uh, I, me and Gideon are both from California, so I feel like we kind of share Emily's sentiment about the um, weather shock, I guess you might feel, um, from coming from a warm place, but honestly, I feel like Cleveland has so much to offer. It, it actually has seasons, unlike California, where it's um, always dry and always very, very hot, um, but like we've had the chance to go um, explore downtown Cleveland there's we've gone to like um, we've gone I've gone like ice skating downtown I've um, tried so many different restaurants here in Cleveland and the food is very very amazing it's really really good I've had the chance to um, I don't even know we've I've explored so much I've gone to like coffee shops to study with friends I have um, had the chance to try late night dessert places that are right here on campus um, whether it's there's like a waffle place on campus that is um, always crowded with undergrad and grad students and it's open until like 3 a.m. at night if you're ever um, craving something sweet um, past midnight. I've, um, I've visited um, aquariums and museums and stuff so I feel like there's always something for everyone to do here um, depending on your interests. And um, for people that have been that have either like been in Cleveland for undergrad or are coming in just for a year for this program, I honestly feel like it's very much what you make of it. Um, you can kind of just like go through the motions of going to your classes and like um, learning within class, but I think you have so many opportunities to um, get involved in research outside of class, to um, join different like organizations around campus um, that don't even have to be related to bioethics at all, but it's just a good way for you to meet people um, and make friends, make connections, um, make plans to like leave campus and explore um, everything that Cleveland has to offer too. So I really feel like you can get everything you can here. And that's, that's saying something because I am from California. So I feel like I've been spoiled a lot with the way that I've grown up. So. Uh, I'll say that the RTA sticker is actually kind of nice because for those who don't know, um, if you're a student in that case, usually you'll get an RTA sticker on your ID card. Um, and that'll allow you to use the public transport system. And the train on campus goes directly to the airport. So you do, so once you get on the train, you literally don't have to go outside again. So if it's snowing, you, it's all the better for you. So I, I like to take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, the public transportation is good. I really enjoy that part. That's, 
that's awesome. I so Gideon, I knew that you guys get RTA stickers. I didn't realize that the train takes you right to the airport. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it leads you right to the basement. It's great. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So we're getting close to the end of time, but I want to make sure that um I briefly cover applications. So for those who are interested in applying, um, there are requirements that you need to submit with your application. Unofficial transcripts are fine for the review process. It's only when you would enroll that you would need your official transcripts. Um, CV or resume, two letters of recommendation. We ask that one of those be from some type of professor or instructor. Um, a statement of purpose. What we're really looking for is your interest in bioethics and medical humanities and how does it fit into your career path? And it could be like some of our panelists who are like really clear on you know, going to medical school, or it could be that you're searching and this is an opportunity to explore areas within healthcare or health policy, or you're not sure if you're pre-med or pre-law or PhD programs. Um, and then uh, graduate test scores are optional. If you're an international student, um, we would eventually, if you're from a non-English speaking university, we would need um, an English test score. And then for those in the combined bachelor's and master's degree, um, formerly known as IGS, um, there's a PPOS form, which you can email me about and we can uh, make sure you get that form. Um, in terms of financial aid and student assistantships, so just um, as was mentioned, students can get involved in different opportunities, including um, teaching, research, or administration. Um, and in exchange, you, students will receive a partial tuition waiver. Um, I will say they're highly competitive, but anyone who's applied to the program um, is eligible to apply. Uh, that application will be coming out very soon. Um, and then we have traditional means of financial aid as well um, for, stu for students um, to pursue. Uh, in terms of timelines, our next um, big due date um, is for the combined bachelor's and master's degree students. So those are current juniors at Case Western Reserve that are looking to do the master's during their senior year or during a fifth year even. Um, that's April 1st um, for this year. If you are um, otherwise applying to the master's program, um, whether it's part of a dual degree or part-time or just the traditional full-time, um, the priority two deadline is May 15th. And if you want to apply for student assistantships, you need to submit your master's application by May 15th. Uh, so keep that in mind. Typically it takes us two to three weeks to review an application. So we do rolling admission. So we try to get this um, done quickly so you can get a decision um, efficiently. Um, I'm going to look really quick. I know we're over time, but I'd like to, we have at least two questions um, from um, attendees. So I think this is a great one um, for panelists to, to answer. It, the question is, how intense would a typical semester look like for the integrated master's program? So for Anushka and Gideon, um, what is the time commitment for the different electives like? So for Anushka and Gideon, how did, how did your time commitment kind of work out for um, being in the, the combined program or the integrated program? I actually thought it's, I, in my opinion, I feel like it's a lot less hectic than it was in undergrad. I don't know how it is for you, Anushka, but at least for me personally, because a lot of the classes are more discussion-based and they're a lot more humanities-based, right? So there's a lot more essays to write rather than like studying for tests or doing assignments, the weekly assignments. Instead of that, you write like one big essay and like, like once a month or something like that. And it's much nicer. Like you get to work at your own pace. And you have a lot more free time, to be honest. Like, I've, I'm actually like, chilling way more than I am before uh, in the last three years. So I'm, I'm enjoying the time commitment. Yeah, um, like what Gideon said, I am, um, I finished, I mean, I think most people in the integrated master's program finish, like, most of their, like, undergrad classes before um, starting their master's. But um, I took, I still took, like, a, an undergrad, like, biology class last semester. I'm in another undergrad class, like, this semester as well. So I'm kind of, like, adding those on to my normal bioethics classes each semester and yeah I, I just feel like they're just they're just a different type of class you're not like studying for any tests or anything but you are just kind of looking forward to these like um deadlines for like essays or like dis discussion posts that you might have so um it's very much kind of like you make your own schedule I guess depending on how early you start an essay or how late you start it um but yeah so I guess the time commitment is very very manageable um um, the, whatever class you take or whatever elective you take as well, they're all, um, they all pretty much follow the same structure in terms of like every like unit might have, might end with like a, an essay. 
um, at the end of it, each one, or you might have just have like one big essay at the end of each semester with just like discussions um, for every class. But yes, it's very manageable. Um, and then there's a question about, um, do you have to declare a concentration going into the program and the study abroad courses? So I'll answer this question just briefly. So you have to decide on a concentration when you're registering for courses, because there are some courses that are required for each of the specific concentrations, but you do not have to declare it until it comes time to register. So for every student, that timeline looks a little different. Um, and the courses that are part of the concentrations, whether it's the Foundations of Medicine, Society and Culture course, or like the Research Ethics and Regulations course, you do not have to be in the concentration to take those. So if you're on the fence about a concentration, in the fall semester, you could take the courses that are required for it and then decide that the concentration is not for you and in the spring pivot or decide to fully commit to the concentration for your spring courses. Um, so you don't have to um, think too much um, ahead when it comes to like deciding to enroll. Um, study abroad programs are popular, but every year is different. So last year we had a very high number of students who did the program. This year um, we're, we're ending up with one course um, as opposed to um, three or four courses. So every year is different. Um, we're in the midst right now of rethinking our study abroad courses and what courses we're offering and what the topics are. And so we're really focused on that for upcoming years and potential potentially new study abroad courses um, that could be coming down um, the pipeline by the time our attendees would be in the program. So that's really exciting too. Um, I, I know we're over time. So I just wanna say that if you have specific questions um, for me or for a faculty or staff in the program, or even one of our panelists, um, please email us, bioethics at case.edu. I'm happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I'm sure a panelist would be happy to have a conversation with you as well, um, if you have you know, specific questions for them uh, too. But um, if, if you're even on the fence of this, if this program is the right fit for you, I'm happy to um, set up a meeting and really talk about your background and how this program um, could be you know, a good fit and have that discussion. So thank you to our panelists, um, Anushka, Gideon, and Emily. I'm so glad you were able to join us and share um, your thoughts about your time in the program. And thanks to our attendees uh, for being here as well. All right. Well, everyone, I hope everyone has a good day and um, I will see the students uh, probably tomorrow in class. So, <laughs> all right. Goodbye, everyone.